Positive Filter with your host, Philip Wilkerson, a podcast that focuses on friends, family, health, and career with a little self-help around the way. Please join me in this journey for self-improvement, and I hope that what I have to share will make you a better person, thus making the world a better place. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it's your boy, Positive Filter, a.k.a. Uh, the Prince of Positivity, a.k.a. I got Austin, Texas on my leg, a.k.a. I'm the most random person you'll ever meet. And I'm joined today by a very special guest. Well, everyone is a special guest, as you know, because they take their time to, to join me. But I got, I think, my second, and I think I had to say, my second NFL player on here. Man, I'm getting all these athletes meet me on the podcast. Makes me feel like... I'm actually made it. I made it. Got these special guests, but I am joined by Ellis Williams. Ellis, give the listeners a little introduction about who you are. Uh, oh, well, my this is Ellis Williams, aka E Dub, uh, aka Insane, yes, uh, aka uh, Super Bowl champ. There you uh, go, Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Uh, yeah, man, it's good to be on. Good to get a chance to talk to you. Uh, it's just uh, great to get a chance to connect with you and your audience and uh, really just kind of have a good a good conversation today, you know, back and forth about just life, business, and whatever you want to talk about, man. So, you know, I'm game. Let's do it. Well, you know, I, I definitely, to be a little bit prepared, I definitely took a look. And um, as we said, t- taking us through your journey, you you played on the Super Bowl champs uh, Buccaneers team. Which Which one was that? Was that the one with Brad Johnson? Yeah, that was Brad Johnson, yeah. the quarterback, you know, Lawrence Sapp, Simeon Rice, Derek Brooks, John Lynch, who's the GM of the 49ers, who's playing in, yeah. um, in the Super Bowl uh, 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 this week, which kind of lets me know I'm getting old when my teammates are like GMs and playing, you know, yes. Yes. And running Super Bowl teams. But, uh, yeah, man, great team, great group of guys. Uh, was fortunate to be on that team. Well, and I also take that uh, – we talked about it earlier – uh, I, I am in the DMV right now. That's where I live. Uh, unfortunately, I'm a Redskins fan. When I say yeah, unfortunately. Very unfortunately. Very <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. and, and so, you know, uh, I've been had the pleasure of meeting um, Brad Edwards, who was on the Super Bowl Redskins team. So you're my second. I guess I'm getting all these football players and Super Bowl champs. You know, I guess this, uh, as a magnet, excellence is gravitating, and I'm getting all these excellent people on my podcast. But uh, – and also tied in, I remember when – Brad Johnson played for the Skins, and of course he left, and that's when he gets to the Super Bowl. But take us through your journey, um, because we're going to talk about how you transitioned from football to your business, but take us through the journey of how you got to playing in the NFL. Uh, Well, no, really, man, I grew up in a small town, Indianola, Mississippi, Uh, and honestly, like, you know, growing up in that environment, like, I had never seen anyone go to college and play football, Mm. much less, you know, playing in the NFL. Uh, so it was a long journey. Uh, and honestly, you know, I could say uh, it wasn't one that I expected. Again, a lot of times your expectations for your life are pretty much structured by you know, what you're around, your environment, your life experiences. So it wasn't something that I expected. Uh, but I was always the type of person that I was just wired to do the work. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and I grew up, you know, my, my school, my high school, my high school football team, it didn't have a winning culture, right? So mm. there are a lot of times where, you know, we have summer workouts and I was the only one there. <laughs> or, you know, yeah. we start the, the season with 80 people on the team. We end the season with 20 people on the team. Oh, wow. Played play yeah. both ways then, obviously. Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah, I played both ways, all special teams. Uh, but, again, I was just always wired to just show up and do the work. Uh, God blessed me with some talent. Uh, I had some great people support me. Uh, and try to put me in situations to get exposure. Uh, I had a chance to go to Mississippi State, and even going to Mississippi State, I was, you know, I was the first person from my high school mm. to get a, 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 a Division One football scholarship. Yes. So even going to Mississippi State, like that was the pinnacle for me. You know, yeah, like you made it. Yes. I'm like I made it, bro. Like I made it out of that small town. I, mean, I get a chance to go to college. Uh, I had my my head coach, Coach Jackie Sherrill, my freshman year. Uh, kind of tell me, hey man, if you if you do what you're supposed to do, you can play in the NFL. And still, I was like, man, get out of here! Like, you know, like that's that's not real. Like, I'm not those guys. Uh, but 
I, again, I just showed up and did the work and just worked really hard every day, did whatever they asked me to do. Uh, and I was able to get drafted in the sixth round by the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Uh, that was a blessing to get drafted onto a great team with great culture, a lot of Hall of Fame players. Mm -hmm. uh, and ended up, you know, being a part of a Super Bowl team my second year in the league. Uh, and was a pretty That's integral part of that, of one of the greatest defenses of all time. So uh, it was, a, you know, a long journey, an unexpected journey, yeah. but kind of a testament of what could happen if you, you know, you have the talent and you're just willing to show up and do the work. Well, so uh, wonderful. And obviously, I, I think so much of people's journeys is, as you said earlier, you know, sometimes just opportunities and doors open, but you just, it, it, in the present moment, you don't think about the NFL. You're just like, I bet you thought, like, let me just show up to practice and be the best at that practice. Let me show up to be the best at this practice. And before you know it, the game, let me just show up to be the best at this game. It's just showing up and then present. And then overall, it, it, it makes like a compilation. You know what I'm saying? Is that how you felt? Like, I'm not focusing on the NFL. Like, let me just show up and be the best when I got to college. Yeah, well, I'll tell you this. My, uh, I played in the NFL. Uh, one of the most impactful people in my life was Rod Marinelli. Uh, he was my defensive line coach for five years. Uh, he 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 just uh, he was the defense coordinator for the Dallas Cowboys up until recently when they you know they fired everybody with the yes. Cowboys. Yeah. Uh, but um, he he had a great. He always had these little sayings uh, that he would give to us just to kind of keep and help us keep perspective. And he always said, "Just be where you are. Like just be where you are. Like don't start thinking about being over here. This thing you want to do." You know, the grass is greener on this side. Just be where you are. Uh, and I think, you know, I was kind of just wired to be that way. But, you know, when I got to the NFL, that was a huge uh, 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 tidbit of information that he just kind of gave me to give me perspective every day. You have this practice. You have this rep. You have this opportunity right now, this moment. Match this out and then move on to the next one. But don't yeah. start thinking about the end of practice at the beginning of practice. <laughs> yeah, I remember, yeah. That's, I, yeah so and don't I, start and I, thinking about the game on Wednesday. So you just got to be where you are. Yeah, I love that. So to transition, um, one of the things that was very impactful, and it's probably going to be impactful for young athletes, especially ones I work with at a college campus, is that uh, the NFL, the funnel for the NFL is so small. Did you recognize that? And did that propel you to think about your academics concurrently while you were in college? Uh, you know what? I think, again, for, for me, it wasn't about thinking about things that I couldn't control. Like, I couldn't control the funnel into the NFL. I can't control, you know, the economy or, you know, anything that's external. I can only control what I can control, and that's, again, to show up and do the work. So if I have a class to go to, uh, go to that class and do your best in that class. Uh, just try to learn. Because, again, growing up in the environment that I grew up in, like, I didn't have a set direction on academics or athletics or anything. Mm. I didn't have, like, a North Star to shoot at for me. So, yeah. you know, if you're fortunate enough to grow up in a household or, or in a community or at a school that can kind of give you direction on a career or mm -hmm. what you want to do with your life, that's great. But, you know, unfortunately, that's not the case for everyone. So mm -hmm. I think the thing that we can control – it's just whatever situation we find ourselves in, just max out, just do your best. Uh, and for me, you know, that's, that's always allowed me to at least find myself in a positive situation around positive people uh, who, who just want to get things accomplished. Uh, and again, I hadn't always had known the exact thing that I wanted to do, but I just always tried to perform in whatever situation I was in. So what did you study in college? I studied technology teacher education. So I wanted to teach technology classes and coach football. Uh, you know, my, uh, my mom put me in uh, like these summer programs when I was like fifth grade where I could do math and English on a computer. So yeah. for me, it was just really cool to just not have to write it down. Like I could, yeah, just, yeah, yeah. I could just type the answer or I could just pick A or, yeah. you know, so it, I was always intrigued by computers. And then, um, in, in, in college, my senior year, I got a chance to take Botech. You know, Botech was like, you know, bo like a vocational training class yes, yes, yeah. that you could take. So we would get on a bus every day, drive 20, 25 minutes up to Leland, Mississippi, 
uh, to go to the, the Votech campus and I took, you know, computer classes where I learned about Microsoft Word, Excel. Mm -hmm. uh, so those classes were always very intriguing to me. So uh, when I got to college, you know, I wanted to teach those classes uh, because you know, that's what, that's kind of my exposure to, to computers and technology up until that point. Like I had really enjoyed it. So I wanted to kind of help other kids get you know exposed to that. You know, what about, I mean, I mean be quite honest, uh, the world of STEM, you know, uh, for people of color is very, very, uh, not say small, like you go in a classroom, you're probably the only black dude, particularly or a person of color and mm -hmm. well, maybe not person of color because we have a lot of international yeah. uh, participants in STEM, you know, from other countries like India and Pakistan. But how was that vibe for you, particularly in college and later on, were you, you, were you like very often the very few person of color in these technology classes? Uh, yeah, uh, definitely. I, you know, I think so. Again, I went to Mississippi State and, uh, you know, that's, uh, it's predominantly white school. Uh, yeah. uh but, you know, we, it, but we had a, a pretty solid, you know, black population. But I think, uh, with things like technology and engineering, again, yeah. it's, it's, you're all, you're only, you're a product of your environment. And I think a lot of times with, with African Americans and minorities in the country, like when you grow up and you're not, uh, exposed to these things, but you're not really pushed to be involved uh, from from a child. Uh, and when you get to college and it's time to make those decisions, you don't feel confident enough to take that track. Uh, but you know, I'm grateful that my mom put me in those programs that she put me in, and then getting a chance to go to Botech as a senior, like that exposure gave me the confidence and, and really just kind of made me aware of that it was something that I was interested in. Yeah. Uh, so when I saw it, you know, you're looking at majors like you have no idea. Like when I first started, I'm like, okay, chemistry. Okay, I'll try that. Yeah. But then I had to take a chemistry class and I was like, you know what? Eh, like I can't really learn this, like, this, this, this periodic table and, you know, all yeah. this stuff that was going, it was just, it was overwhelming for me as a, as a, as a, a college football player and all the yeah. time I had to commit to that and commit to being a chemistry major. But I just chose that because it's like, okay, it looks cool. But yes. I, didn't, yes. I didn't know anything about what that meant. So honestly, the technology teacher education, it was like, okay, I've had some exposure to computers. Yes. So yeah. I feel comfortable with it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it, I think that's an issue with, you know, with, it, with you know, minorities in certain communities yeah. where they're not exposed to it or f have the confidence to feel like it's something that they can do. I love that. Did you ever get some adverse looks or like, you know, for instance, uh, the, uh, what are you doing in the room kind of looks like when you, you know, like for instance, I've experienced this just in general life. And I, I've been exposed to quite a lot being a military kid all over the place. But yeah. when you go, when you go into certain rooms and people are like, what are you doing here? And you're like, I don't know. I like it. This is something I mm -hmm. like. And, yeah. and they're like, really? And you're like, that kind of like makes you feel some type of way. Like, wow, this person is doubting my, my abilities or doubting yeah. my, my interest just because they look at me and they don't think mm -hmm. people like me should be interested or good at this. Did you mm -hmm. ever get some looks like that within the technology world? I, I think uh, for me, like I am totally, and my wife will tell you, I am totally unaware of what other people think. Yeah. Like I am totally unaware. And then sometimes that's good, sometimes that's bad. Yeah. But I am totally unaware. And my wife will tell me sometimes, like I'll be having a conversation with somebody yeah. Like, well, you know that person was being rude to you. <laughs> yeah, that's me too. <laughs> like, yeah. like, it don't really matter. Like, I, because it's not about what they think. Yeah. It's about me. Like, and how I'm not being rude. And no matter yeah. what you say or do, I'm not going to let you, like, take me to a place of negativity. So I'm just unaware of other people sometimes. Again, yeah. it's, it's, it's good sometimes and sometimes it's bad. But I'm that's just, it. like, aloof. Like, I'm like, oh, really? You don't like me? Like, I didn't know that, but yeah. that's cool too. <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, uh, it, it's kind of, I have a double edge. Sometimes I, uh, I'm the president of the Overthinker Club Yeah, uh, with it, but that's Overthinker Club and myself. But I am similar in some way. Well, I'm like, yo, that person threw shit at you. They did, like, they did? Like, yeah, I totally missed that. Like, oh, okay. They're like, that person, right, well, like, that person was so condescending. I was like, I didn't catch that. Oh, well. Yeah, I did. Like, <laughs> I don't catch it. And then I'm like, well, my wife, I'm like, I wish you really didn't make, like, tell me that. Because I really, like, yeah. I don't yeah. really, it, I, not to say I don't care, but it's like, it doesn't yeah. register to me. I'm like, the only thing that registers really is like, 
Like yeah. just interactions with people. I enjoy yeah. doing that. I like building yes. relationships. I like building positive relationships. Yes. It's fruitful and beneficial for, you know, both parties. So like anything negative, it don't really register to me. Yeah. So as you transition to the NFL, right? And you're working your full career. This is it, the career. Did you still hold on to that interest in computers? Like, for instance, uh, still do some self-training and learning or like maybe say, okay, let me, you know, uh, get back to summer camp. You know, all the NFLs have charities. Like my project within the NFLs, I'm going to help with computers and buy the old school computers. Did you hold on to like that, 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 that science and technology while you were in the NFL? Uh, honestly, like, uh, when you're in the NFL and, um, like my coach always used to kind of tell us, like I said, like, be where you are. Like, and yeah, I always did stuff like, like from the time, like, I want to say like some from 2003, like when I was a really young player, like I used to host, I used to go back to my hometown and like host football camps, mm-hmm. uh, go visit and speak to schools. Uh, but the technology part of it, uh, I didn't really, I don't think I really knew how to like do that and again when you're in a in the nfl it's a once in a lifetime opportunity Mm -hmm. uh you have to really really stay focused because every single year somebody's coming to take your job and again i was i was a six round pick so you know they throw away six round picks like you know like the trash like they you know Mm -hmm. they like you know they they give you thirty forty thousand dollars to sign they really don't care about releasing you if you're not working out like they give you five hundred thousand dollars to sign they ain't want to get some yeah. work, right? They yeah. want to like, look, bro, you suck, but we going to get some work. Like, you want to practice, you're going to do something. Like, we got to try to make sure this works out because we have to validate to the organization that we paid the money. We gave you half a million dollars. We gave you $40,000, bro. We don't, like, it's not a big deal. So, like, when you're in the NFL and it's so much competition, and again, every single year, somebody's coming in and they want that job. A hundred and yes. some guys are coming to training camp. 53, 50 guys are going home. Only 53 guys are going to make that team every wow. single time. So you have to come out and prove it, especially when the team hasn't invested a lot of money in you. Like, they'll okay. move on in a second. So I, you know, you when you're in it, and I tell young players, man, while you're here, like, focus on being here. And then mm-hmm. after you're done here, then you can kind of maybe transition into thinking about other things. Not that you don't, like, in the offseason, you're not preparing yourself for being yeah. after football because it can end at any time. Yeah. But you have to be able to keep your mental, your mental focus on the job at hand. Uh, and just a little bit off the subject with that, like, I honestly, like, I think why the situation with Colin Kaepernick uh, kind of happened with him not being in the NFL right now is, like, everybody's job is on the line. And, like, from the head coach – to the last person on the roster, we're all dependent on each other being all in. Because if the head coach gets fired or the GM gets fired, then everybody can be fired. And then yeah. everybody's unemployed. Yeah. So we want everybody on this roster from the top to the bottom to be locked in to making sure that we go out and we do our job to the best of our ability. Because if we win, we have job stability. If we lose, we don't. Uh, and that's just how the NFL works. So uh, you have to be all in or out uh, when you're on these teams because, but, again, it's such a small window that you get to be able to, to be in the league. Well, I understand that, too. And I bet, like, for, like from two days on, it's locked in. But uh, And maybe the, the game has changed, especially the expectations, because, um, mm-hmm. um, you know, like way back in – if you go back in the historic, uh, history of the NFL, I mean, when it wasn't big money – Dudes had normal jobs in the off season, mm-hmm. you know, like, like dudes was working at the grocery store, a cabin, like mm-hmm. these guys that are hall of famers for like the lions, like back in the forties, because mm-hmm. it was no money. But then as the game changes, the expectations of what you do in the off season gets more and more increased. Absolutely. Uh, I, because I think even when Brad Edwards was talking to me from the nineties or when he was winning the Super Bowls in the late eighties, he had internships with like uh, Booz Allen and stuff mm-hmm. over the, over the off season. But you think the game was a lot significantly different from Brad Edwards to you? Like you couldn't even, even in the off season, you couldn't have internships and stuff like that. No, no, because they're so, OTs. Yeah. Uh, and again, yeah. you got to understand, like these are multi-million dollar jobs. Yeah, they're like, different. Yeah, it's multi-million dollar jobs. Like you, you, you sign a big contract. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, like I was a backup defensive lineman. 
Like, mm-hmm. I made almost ten million dollars in the NFL as a backup defensive lineman. Yes. Uh, uh, so uh, that's mm-hmm. that's a life changing experience yeah. for for a boy that came from Indianola, Mississippi, who mom was living in a shotgun house the day I got drafted. Yeah. Uh, so that's a life. So in the off season, like. You when you show up to training camp, you yeah. better be fit and ready for war. Yeah, that makes sense. Day. Yeah, because yeah, because you're not getting paid uh, five hundred dollars like back in the forties. <laughs> no, no, it's not. It's not that yeah. right. It's, it's uh, a yeah. life changing yeah. opportunity. It's a lot. It's a it's lot. Different. The, the it's, game has it's changed. Much different. So the off season, there's OTAs. You know, there, there, and every time you step on a football field, you're being judged. You're being tracked. You're being evaluated. So even though it's off-season practices, you know, uh, we have mm-hmm. these organized team activity days uh, three times during the, the off-season where it's like, you know, a four-day weekend where you're practicing. Uh, but it's being filmed and recorded. And then the rookie class is there. And the free agents are there. So it's competition that's setting the table going into training camp of yeah. what the expectations are. Okay, man, he looked good in OTAs. Let's see if he can carry it in the training camp. And that's your competition for that job. So when you show up, there is no time to be out of shape, unaware, not mentally sharp, not locked, not locked in. Because again, you can lose a multi-million dollar opportunity if you're not prepared to compete. Do you think that's fair? Because what I would go and and, and just and wondering as a question is: yes, they're paying you a lot of money. Yes, uh, you're locked and loaded, ready for war. But the football is not not even from GM down is everyone's entire life. And mind you, what is the, the league's responsibility to train or develop, you know, rookies and whatnot to be prepared mm-hmm. for the world outside of football? You know, as you said earlier, one of the things that, that stuck out in my mind is that exposure to like job skills and how to manage your money and just this world of work even if football is, you know, your job or world of work, for certain people from small towns in Mississippi, this is their big exposure. Uh, never seeing money like this or never seeing how you talk to owners or wear a suit and be a businessman. Mm-hmm. Uh, what do you think is the league's responsibility to develop the professional side of, like, coming to work and, mm-hmm. and, and having people prepared for the world of work? Well, I think I, I think the NFL in itself, uh, again, the culture in the NFL is one that prepares you for work. Again, mm-hmm. uh, I've seen guys who are super talented, uh, guys that come in that probably were more talented than me in my position or more talented as a wide receiver, come in and, you know, do a great job in OTAs, look like a great player, but then they couldn't be professional, right? Mm-hmm. They couldn't show up on time. Mm-hmm. They couldn't be dependent upon the, to do their job, to understand the information. So they got cut because they couldn't be pros. Uh, so, I, you know, it's professional athletics. It's professional football. And young players who come in, if they can't adopt that professional mentality, then they don't stick. Because, again, we're all dependent upon each other to do our job, right? Because yeah. if you're not – if all 11 guys aren't doing their job, then we fail. So, so if we can have a perfect play – and if 10 guys do their job and one guy doesn't, the play fails. Uh, so you have to develop, develop those professional characteristics just to be able to be around. In a win, on a winning team, now there's some teams that suck yeah. and have losing culture. And uh, honestly, the, the Redskins have been one of those teams. <laughs> where they yeah. suck and they yeah. have a losing culture, right? Yeah. So, but you also notice that nobody's coming through Washington like picking up Washington free agents. Right, winning teams because they know those guys haven't been like prepared to win. But say you play for the Patriots, mm-hmm. right? They know you've been trained and built under a winning culture and you understand what it takes to be a professional. So yeah. even though you might not be as athletic or have the talent that this guy from the Redskins have, you want that winning culture within your locker room. And I think the NFL does a lot to try to expose guys. I think what, what a lot of people don't understand is you're dealing with 20 something year old guys. Well, I'm, I, hey, hey, you know, I know I'm working, I, and I, that's what I was asking because not even an NFL culture, I, I work with that in the higher ed culture of mm-hmm. uh, not just talking about coming to college to just get a degree, but we also have a responsibility to, to help develop students to be professionals and go to work. And mm-hmm. such as things like time management, showing mm-hmm. up to things on time, 
uh, knowing how to interview people and shake hands and network and interview well, you know, and how to speak. Uh, mm -hmm. Definitely that's a responsibility that I take very, uh, very strongly. And especially uh, I advise certain students, like I advise the alphas here on campus mm -hmm. and I advise the uh, students in the NAACP that I'm not just telling them how to book meetings. I also want to prepare these young people to, to be good at work. So yeah. I definitely, definitely agree with that too. It's like, you got to, there's little things that are, that are taken for granted that those things do prepare you for work, showing up yeah. on time and being respectful and timely and writing, responding to emails and all that stuff. Yeah. And, and again, it's like, um, there's certain just, you know, within successful companies, there's mm -hmm. successful culture. And mm -hmm. you'll see all the time where not just in football, just in life, you're like, man, that dude is really talented, mm -hmm. but he don't know how to work with people. That yeah. dude is really talented, but he's not dependable. Yes. Like, so you, you see those things. And, and, you know, the thing with the NFL, the, the, the trouble, the, the default problem is these are always very young kids. They come into more money than they've ever had in their life. Yes. And I tell people all the time, okay, you're 45, 50 years old. It's easy to say what you would do with $10 million. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. what would you do with $10 million if you were 22 years old? Like, uh, what would uh, you do? Like, most people, like, they're not, like, you can say, okay, I'm going to go start business. I'm going to go invest. But more than likely, you're going to go buy a Ferrari. More than yeah. likely, you're going to go to some parties. More than likely, you're going to go to strip clubs. More than likely, you're yeah. going to do exactly what those kids are doing because that's what we do when we're young. These yeah. kids just get exposed because, yeah. you know, because they're in the spotlight. But they're no different than any of us like, who would be 21, 22, 23, 24 years old coming into that type of money, never had it before. I was about to say that. That would be the main thing would be like, even if they never had it before, I, I would, let's say... I got two working parents. My, 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 my mom's a doctor. I mean, this mm -hmm. is true. My mom's a doctor. My dad's an army colonel. And mm -hmm. so even if I played it, if I made it to the NFL, uh, while my parents never got no millions of dollars, I've, mm -hmm. seen, I've seen that level of, of, of my dad making six figures in regards mm -hmm. to the military career and my mom making six figures as a doctor. So I would probably, you're right, like in my mindset, I can have my parents as advisors mm -hmm. or have a little bit, you know, I'm pretty sure like, RG3, his dad was a military guy, mm -hmm. or Mike, uh, or Shaq, his parents mm -hmm. in the military, where they'd be like, you know, you got $10 million, shout out to you, but they would, they would coach you a little bit. But yeah. you're right, like, if I'm the first one in my generation, uh, in my level, I don't have a parent to, to give me ex ad advice, yes, I totally agree with you. I would not know what to do with $10 million. You, you, you wouldn't. And it, again, I think uh, where we are now is, really trying to make sure we're developing not just a generation of kids, but a generation of parents mm -hmm. uh, to be good stewards of mm -hmm. their children, to be able to a advise their children. Uh, you know, and again, I, you know, I, I take that role in my life more serious than anything as being a husband and a father, because I didn't have my father growing up. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and I was that guy, you know, that, you know, I just had my mom and I came from nothing. Uh, and, mm -hmm. So just really like having to figure everything out in the mm -hmm. world on your own. Yeah. Like it's a tough thing. And I I uh I don't want to ever put my children in a situation where they don't they can't say, you know, you know right now you can pick up the phone and call your dad. And if you can't trust nobody on the planet to give you the truth, you know you can trust your dad. You know you can trust your mom. Uh and you know your dad is prepared to give you good advice mm -hmm. uh but that's that's not uh most african americans uh, yes. experience uh so it's a it's a tough thing for a lot of these young men and the nfl does a lot to give guys different programs like they have programs that were in business school and career yeah. transition programs they do yes. a lot of things but yeah. you've got to be in a mindset to take advantage and unfortunately yeah. like when you're in your 20s and you're living life and you feel invincible and the 80,000 people cheering you every week. Yeah. Like it's hard to think about going to war in business school. Or that war is like, or uh, even Warden is like, wow, like I know from working in higher ed that Warden business school was one of the top notch. But someone else that never heard of, they'd be like, it's some college. They want me to go to. What? Like, <laughs> yeah, like, what I've never this? heard of it. I'm like, Warden, yeah. like, what is that? Like, you yeah, know, like exactly. if yeah. you told me, if you told me let's go to USC or you know, like to go, yeah. you know, 
Like, yes. okay, yeah, I, I heard of that, right? <laughs> exactly. Okay, I can do that. It's in LA. Yeah. What? Yeah. Like, what? Like, yeah. You pin? So, you pin? Where is this? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like, so, so you, you understand it. Like, you would probably yeah. understand the value of it. Yeah. But a, a young kid from the boondocks yeah. who never, like, had any exposure to that, he's like, like I don't really understand why I should go there. So you know that that's the that's the issue that the NFL kind of deals with. They offer a lot of programs, but yeah. you got to be in the right mindset to take advantage. Who was okay? So if you didn't have your father, and I know like was this pre Tony Dungy? Like he yes. left by the time because I know he. I know no, he, I played one year with Tony. I played. He drafted me. Because I was about to say, I, from what I heard and read, you know, I, I, you know, he's one of my favorite coaches. First of all, I'm going to say I always had a backup team, which sounds bad to say. So I love the Indianapolis Colts. I love yeah. Peyton Manning. And I definitely uh, love Tony Dungy. I, I follow him. I listen to his, you know, read his books. I love his mentorship. Uh, and I know that he's shown uh, – for a lot of players and a lot of people, they, they always shot him out as a good mentor for a lot of people. Um, did you seek – you know, did you get, like, since you said your father wasn't around, did you have mentorship or, or a person to look up to, such as a Tony Dungy or anyone, to to give you some good advice? Um, I'll say that, like, you know, football was awesome for me. Mm -hmm. uh, one, because, you know, it, it, I didn't have my father, so it gave me structure. Mm -hmm. uh, it always put me around men because, again, mm -hmm. if you're a high school football coach, like you ain't making a whole lot of money doing that, yes, right? Yes, like yeah. so, you're you're doing that because you care about the young men in the community and you yeah. want to see that community be better. Yes, uh, yes. and going to college, uh, Coach Jackie Cheryl again was like a father figure to a lot of us. Uh, mm -hmm. I will always give him credit for a lot of the young men who came through that program, who today are good husbands and good fathers, mm -hmm. who didn't come from that environment, uh, because he gave us grace. Uh, mm -hmm. in mercy, in love, in understanding, uh, mm -hmm. through a lot of mistakes where it could have been like, man, okay, you did that, get out of my program. Mm -hmm. But he called you in your office, in his office, talk to you, try to understand what happened, try to encourage you, and just try to make sure you got through and graduated and were on your mm -hmm. way to being a, a good, productive member of society. Yes. Uh, and getting drafted by Tony Dungy, man, I mean, um, he set such a standard for us as men, uh, mm -hmm. not just as football players, but as, mm -hmm. again, as husbands, as fathers, as members of a community. Uh, he valued family. Uh, mm -hmm. He always encouraged us to go out in the community and represent the organization in the right way. Mm -hmm. um, uh, he, was, he just uh, was never really angry, always steady, uh, always mm -hmm. uh, but very competitive. Yeah. Had very, yeah, like very competitive and had a certain nature about him where when it was time to go to war, you got that energy from him like, okay, let's go out here and let's like kick these dudes face in right now. Yeah. Right. But he, he was very, he wasn't like a yeller and a screamer. Mm -hmm. uh, he just was a, just was a leader. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, the, it was a blessing for me to get a chance to be around men like that. Cause honestly it shaped a lot of who I am today and what my priorities are today. Yeah. So jumping all the way through and you live a great, you're doing a great career. Your career is coming to an end. Was there a panic mode or just this natural, like this is the next step and let me just do as I've normally done and just transition to a new part. Uh, you know, like was like a holding on, like, you know, sometimes some players probably hold on way too long and they get their body just beat up or was there more like, okay, this is, this is it, you know, I'm getting older. Uh, the younger players are coming in. Uh, let me start thinking about my, my, my career post athletics and, and start just preparing what I need to do next. You know, take us to that. Uh, I think um, uh, for most players in every uh, professional sport, like you don't necessarily get to choose when it's over. Right, they. Oh, okay. you, some you of them do, but some of them do just be like, "I'm done." Like Barry Sanders, like I'm done. <laughs> yeah, that's but that's very few. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah. You know, they're trying to play until somebody tell them that, "Look, man, we're not gonna hire you no more." <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Hired. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And again, that was the case with me. Like, you know, I, 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 I got to the point where nobody else would hire me. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as like injuries to my body, mm -hmm. uh, again, I had shoulder issues, back issues, ankle issues. So it just gets to a point, man, it's a war of attrition. 
uh, your body just can't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and that wasn't something that I wanted to accept, but eventually mm -hmm. you have to accept it. And honestly, mm -hmm. you know, transitioning out of the NFL, I was kind of lost, mm -hmm. right? I didn't know what I wanted to do because that was my life. Like that's, I put mm -hmm. my life and my energy into playing football and I hadn't really thought past that. And mm -hmm. again, that's the case for a lot of players where, um, once they're out of the game, they struggle because your identity and everything that you are mm -hmm. is within the game. Yeah. Uh, and it, to a certain extent, it kind of almost has to be to be able to do it at that level, at a high level. Like you have to be mentally and physically committed to it. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I struggled. And uh, like I, I let, for a long time, I let other people kind of, you know, dictate kind of what I did or, hey, man, I think you'd be good at this. Hey, come try this. Hey, you know, man, this, you know, this could be something that you could do. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like, so it because I didn't know, like, I didn't have a direction. Mm -hmm. uh, so for me, uh, after I just got tired and frustrated of doing things that I was really unhappy with, that really didn't fit who I was, like, I always have done community work, like, always. Mm -hmm. So um, I started to, I started a foundation that uh, we wanted to help uh, students find innov innovative ways to stay fit, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I started working with Microsoft, had them as a partner, uh, partner with you know, uh, the city of Houston, working with a lot of their uh, their their community centers, working with mm -hmm. school, uh, installing Xboxes with the Connect systems to get mm -hmm. kids up and off the couch moving. But while I was working with Microsoft, I kind of saw that they were doing a lot with computer science education, like in the mm -hmm. store. Mm -hmm. If you didn't come into a Microsoft store, like you didn't have access to this to these opportunities. So I started to think, like, okay, man, like, what if we can take these opportunities, like, into schools, into into community centers? Uh, and so I started uh, a company that kind of teaches these classes. Yeah, uh, that a lot of schools and a, and a lot of community centers, a lot of organizations want and need, uh, but we do it remotely. Uh, so again, um, coming out of football, mm -hmm. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I had no direction, no North, North star. And I got pulled in a lot of different directions. Mm -hmm. And I eventually just had to sit down and say, man, who are you and yeah. what do you want to do and right. what will work for you? Uh, and once I kind of figured that out, then things started to move in the right direction. Yeah. I love that. I love that. I love that. Uh, it just kind of pulls it to you. It's like, if you don't dictate who you are, people are going to try to force who they think you are to you. Mm -hmm. And if it's not firm, I've learned over time, if you're not firm in yourself, uh, then when you get pulled in all these different directions, you don't make as strong decisions because you really don't know who to listen to. And sometimes yeah. the best person to listen to is yourself. Yeah. It's like, you, you, again, you let other people kind of dictate Mm -hmm. And then they other they're using your time, right? Because time is 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 finite. Like you you know we don't exactly. have we don't have forever. Uh, so how you use your time and energy, I mean, you need to be using it in a way that makes sense for you uh, and your happiness and your personality and your your tools and gifts that you've your been skills. given. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so I you know that's that's a tough thing for a lot of people, but especially for NFL athletes because yeah. or pro athletes in general because again. It's just like with an engineer or an attorney or anybody who's had a certain career for 20, 30, 40 years. Yeah. They say, okay, that's taken away. Now what is, now who are you? Yeah. When you define yourself by this career, like, you know, somebody asks you, man, they don't ask you who you are, they ask you, what do you do? Yeah. Right? I joke, you know, when people do that to me, I always troll them and say I'm a dad. <laughs> and, then, and then they're like, for real, what are you doing? And then I tell them my job because, you know, like I said, I throw people off because that is not my firmest identity, honestly. Yeah. And um, and I think that's true, like, across anything where you invest so much time. I think, you know, for, for instance, my dad had a hard time. 30 years in the Army, he was a Army colonel. That's mm -hmm. who he was. People called him Colonel Wilkerson. They didn't like say Mr. They, 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 they said Colonel Wilkerson, his title. So I'm pretty sure he had a, a long time of like, who am I post-military? Because mm -hmm. his, whole, his whole adult life from uh, being 18 years old on was the military. He even went to a military college. So mm -hmm. his whole life was military. So I'm pretty sure when you invest so much that when it's changing or transition, it's hard. And especially when 
that's how you look in the mirror and you saw yourself too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, and that's not there anymore. So it's like, you know, that's, that's, uh, but the NFL again, I think has done a good job of identifying that as a problem and doing their absolute best to create programs and, and support systems to help guys figure that out. Cause again, it's not as easy as just saying, okay, I don't play football no more. Now I do this. Yeah. Like, it's not that easy. It's, it's, it, it, and that there's a mental, like yeah. that, that's a mental struggle. And that's, that's the, you have to change the way you see yourself. And, and again, it's not an easy thing. What about when was the time, for instance, when is the time where you go, aha, uh, this gives me just as much joy as playing football. Like I got it. Like when you say I got it, like I'm doing the things for the community and this is where, this is where I feel good about it. Like I feel like this new identity, I'm filled in, I'm, I'm filled into it. When did that when did that click for you? Uh, well, you know, again, we do uh, we we do the classes via video mm -hmm. conference. So mm -hmm. uh, the great thing about it is, like, I can plug into students anywhere in the country, really anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. So I get to leverage my platform as an athlete, like in the educational system, in a area that every, federal, state, local governments, private sector understand that we need to improve in STEM education and tech education yes. in the economy. So for me, the, the aha moment, honestly, is when I see one of my students have that kind of moment, right? Mm -hmm. So I, when I see a fourth grader or fifth grader going through the curriculum and they're struggling with something and all of a sudden I hear, I got it, mm -hmm. right? And it's like, okay, I know they just learned something new. They just had a breakthrough, right? Mm -hmm. That's like, that's the energy for me, right? That just gives me the energy to keep going and keep moving because, again, I'm seeing my students mm -hmm. learn and improve and get better. And like I told you before, like, I know how the exposure to something kind of mm -hmm. drove me to yeah. technology teacher education. Yes. So the goal of our organization is to give that exposure yep. to all of our children and try to you know, inspire them to believe that when that opportunity comes for them to choose what they want to be, or choose what they want to focus on, or choose what they want to learn. Uh, they choose something that's relevant, and they choose something that's profitable. Yeah, uh, they choose something that can that can really kind of give them the ability to 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 live the life that they want to live. Uh, and uh, so that for me is like the, uh, the that moment for me, like when I when I when I first saw one of my students like learn something and be excited about what they just learned. Yeah. Yeah, that's positive. Uh, so we're going to go to the pivot, and this is the part of the show I didn't tell you before the call. I call it shot for shot. Uh -huh. and, and shot for shot meaning I get to ask you any random question related to this topic or not, and you get to ask me any random question. Um, do you want to go first or I go first? Uh, I'll let you go first, man. I'm, I, I'm ready for this, though. I, I specialize at random answers. Yes. So let's do this. Anything, so, I, make it hard. Let's go. No, okay. Well, it's not super hard, but it was often, like, I think of these shot for shots while I talk. And the main thing that's been so, so firm is identity, right? Mm -hmm. And if you look back, I don't know if you can see there, I have written down, like, the roles in my life. Uh huh. Order, and I have, you know, like, me. Uh, I had to be truthful to myself, husband, father, friend, and then I have my job. Mm -hmm. And so we'll get to that. So can you, if you have, you know, take a little bit, if you need a little bit of time while I make up fake Jeopardy music, can you tell me at least five firm identities that you believe are part of who you are, why those are firm, and how do you live those each day? So for instance, uh, one that's really firm to me is being a husband. Uh, you know, uh, she, my, I love my wife. and if it wasn't for her, you know, literally she wouldn't get, I wouldn't have the opportunity to be a father and all that stuff. And so how I reaffirm that is always make sure I check in with my wife every day. I send her every time I send her at least, a, every time I drop my boys off, I send her a random text to say, I love you or just something. I, I appreciate her or something like that. So tell me your five, your five most firm identities. Uh, I mean, I think it'll be very like similar to you. I mean, I think first of all, uh, being a husband, to my wife again that is my partner in life mm -hmm. uh and uh is it nothing uh in my life uh goes how i want it to go if i'm not aligned with my wife mm -hmm. uh and she's been amazing uh she's been very supportive uh she's a great mother uh you know she's a hard worker 
Uh, and I honestly lucked out because, again, I married a beautiful, beautiful woman uh, that's an amazing person. Uh, so I lucked out there. So I would say a husband, a father. Uh, I, I definitely I would I would put second again. I absolutely love my children. I have a 19 year old who's a who's a pharmacy student student at Ole Miss. I have a 10 year old uh, son here, and I have eight year old twins, boy girl. Uh, yeah. So my house is on fire every single day. Uh, but I love my children, uh, and I put all that I am into making sure I support them and love them and give them every opportunity to live the life that they want to live. Uh, I would say uh, a leader. Mm, uh, yes. I, my, I think I have the ability to communicate uh, and communicate things uh, in a way that, that people get it. Uh, mm. I think I can disarm people. I think uh, I don't really, uh, uh, I can see through a lot of the, the, mm. the, 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 the the blockades, the mental blockades, whether it's race or mm-hmm. uh, or economics or whatever things that that mm-hmm. are put out there to try to divide us, I think I do a great job at communicating with every single person in every single situation, and I could be in any room in anywhere on the planet and feel like I belong there. Oh, that's powerful. I like that. So, so I think uh, a leader. Uh, I think I'm a competitor. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Competitor. Yeah. I, yeah, I think I'm a, a competitor. I think uh, I love to compete. Uh, I still, you know, I can't play football anymore, but I still play in like some basketball leagues. Uh, yeah, you know, like all my all my kids are in sports, and I've I've coached all of them. You know, I mm-hmm. coached, trained, I trained my you know, my my ten year old, my eight year old son to play basketball and baseball. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm teaching my I'm teaching my my eight year old daughter uh, to be a tennis player. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I want to compete at business. You know, I want to build a company uh, that that can be successful and, and, and be powerful and be influential. Uh, and then I would say, as a friend, uh, the fifth thing, like being mm-hmm. a like uh, m- my friends uh, who I talk to, my friends who know me, uh, know they can call on me. Uh, like I'm the I'm the person that they call for advice about things. Mm-hmm. Like man, I had this happen at work today, or my child is doing this. A oh, man, I'm in this situation with my wife. What do you think? Mm-hmm. Uh, so just being a good friend and just being there to to listen, not to like, you know, you know, take any sides, but just try to mm-hmm. get them to have the right perspective yeah. about whatever issue that they're having. Because a lot of times it's like things happen and it's like you want to be angry with your wife or you want to be angry mm-hmm. with this person or this person did me wrong. And it's like to try to have perspective on uh everybody's life experience, even if the person is racist and don't like you because they're, yeah. they're racist, hey, they've had a life experience that taught them to be that way. Yeah. So you can't really let them people take you to a place of negativity. You got to kind of stand in a place of understanding when something happens and test that mm-hmm. right, in your life. So just trying to be a good friend, a good leader. Uh, and, and I would say friend slash mentor. Yeah, you know, like yes. uh, and just really trying to be supportive to everybody in my life. So I would say husband, father, uh, uh, competitor, yeah, leader, uh, uh, friend, uh, yeah, friend and a mentor. Uh, 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 sure. and that I think that would be that would be me. Well, don't ask me that same question because I got the same one. So. <laughs> I got, I got, because I got, I got, I got mentorship too. That's very important to me, and especially as I mentor these young students all the time as an educator, but also the particular when I zoom in into the clubs and organizations that I'm a faculty advisor for, or particularly men of color, I'm definitely, I'm a mentor and I got my number. They be asking me questions that are not even related to education. It can be like, yeah. yo, man, I got my, I got, I got this, John, how do you, how do you talk to your part-time boss this way? I'm mm-hmm. like, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah. I, I, and, we, people, and again, they need that. They need that because yeah. you, you have the life experience yeah. uh, with, and you've traveled. And you, so you've seen the world, and so you kind of can give them a different perspective. And a lot of times, kids just haven't had your perspective, and again, they they need that. So let me ask, let me ask you, okay? So where do you see yourself ten years from now? (laughs) See, there you go. Um, So that is the part where I'm balancing between, uh, like you said, living in the present, the day to day. What can I do today, as, as opposed to you know the long term and I'm very I think I'm very good at the uh short term like for instance I definitely every year write out 
things I want to knock out in 2020 mm-hmm. um, and, and, and in 10 years. Uh, but I'm still like, if I close my eyes and try to picture, you know, visualize the visualization of five to 10 years, it's still fuzzy. Yeah. Um, uh, what I do see myself doing is talking <laughs> a lot. And yeah. whether that's in front of a lot of people. So I would say one of my long-term things, if I close my eyes and visualize um, what I want to do in five years or 10 years, I always picture an audience. And I don't know if that sounds like narcissistic, which I don't think it is. No, I help, not at all. I want to help people, but I always picture myself on some form of stage or some form of auditorium with lots of people, not just, um, you know, scary. Like, like the kind that scares me, like, an audience of like a thousand. Yeah. I, I've never, I've talked to kids, I talked to about 500, that's the most, mm-hmm. which was like a high school class. Mm-hmm. But, I, but when I close my eyes about the further one, I mm-hmm. picture like, I picture a stadium. Yeah. But not a, but not a, but not no, uh, like, you know, not no, uh, Jay Z, J. Cole concert stadium. That's yeah. the, <laughs> nah, nah, I'm still realistic. Like, yeah. at least, like at least like a, a, a gym auditorium with like, 5,000 people. That's yeah. what I, well, I can close well, my eyes and picture that. Well, so that's what I, I see myself in 10 years or five years. Well, well let, me, let me say this to you. Uh, you know, uh, very sad day yesterday yeah. with the great Kobe Bryant passing. Uh, and I think more than a basketball player, like Kobe Bryant was a transformational leader. Yeah. Uh, and one of the great things that I think he did was, uh, especially recently, was he issued challenges to yeah. people, right? Oh, he, yeah, I remember that. He had a little he challenge. challenges to people to take things to the next level. So, again, in the spirit of the great Kobe Bryant uh, and the Mamba mentality, I'm going to challenge you to be the dean at the college that you're currently at in 10 years, like to run the whole show. Like, yeah. every, that'll, yeah. that'll put you in front of thousands of people very, very often. So I'm going to challenge you right now. I'm going to make a mama ta- challenge to you. <laughs> yeah. that in 10 years, you run the whole show. Everything at the college goes through you. Everything, you, you dictate the direction. You set the mood. You set the culture. You set the standard. So I'm going to issue a mama mentality challenge to you. 10 years from now, you run the whole show. And that'll yeah. put you right in front of Everybody, all yeah. 5,000, 10,000, however many students you yeah. got there, yeah. that'll, 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 that'll knock out two birds with one stone. So I'm okay. going gonna, I'm gonna to issue that challenge to you in the spirit of the great Kobe Bryant right so, there. So, so I guess, and I guess in, in general, in that pursuit of that, the day-to-day things will get me closer and closer to that. Absolutely. And I can't get fired within 10 years. Yeah. No, no, you can't get fired. Yeah. You can't have no scandals. No scandals. You gotta, you gotta keep your eye open. Like you gotta be you gotta, like you gotta watch this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right here. So, yeah. I like so, again, like, I definitely I definitely we won a we won a Super Bowl. Yeah. But the the goal was to win the Super Bowl. The mantra was just keep pounding the rock. You know, like you're trying to break a rock and you keep hitting, you keep swinging. You don't know when it's going to break. You don't know when it's going to break, but you keep swinging. You yeah. take every every chop, of, you take every chop of that wood, so you just keep chopping. But you know ultimately what the goal is. So, uh, yeah, man, uh, I, it's uh, – I, I, Oh, dang, I got to put that on my – I got to go backwards now. I got to get my 10-year goal and go back down and still do my one a year. I do the – I definitely write down my one-year goals. So yeah, that's great. So now I like that challenge. I might have to put that in the, I have to write that down because if I forget. Yeah. Mamba mentality, baby. All right. So you've been an amazing guest. I think, you know, I, I definitely want the listeners to be able to follow up with you. And so we're, we're at the segment of my show uh, called Shout Outs and Plugs, meaning shout out whoever you want to shout out. The floor is yours. And then plugs. Please let the listeners know anything that you're working on, anywhere they can follow up with you on social media, any of that stuff. The, the stage is yours. Shout out some plugs. Uh, well, first of all, I uh, have to give a shout out to Out of the Box Realty. Uh, again, they've been the, the, the company that uh, that helped me kind of be able to, you know, find platforms and, and, and influential platforms to, to get out and kind of tell, tell my story and talk about what I do. 
Uh, they build affordable housing in communities like the communities that I grew up in. That's why I kind of gravitated to them and what they do. They build affordable housing. Again, on my on draft day, my mom was living in a shotgun home that you can see the floor, you know, see the ground through the floor. Uh, and a lot of times with those communities, uh, you know, the way they look kind of dictate how people treat them, their energy in that community. So I love the fact that out of the box realty is like really helping like change the look and feel and energy uh, in these communities, which, you know, we, we, this podcast is just about positive energy mm -hmm. because positive energy in the environment in, you're in a lot of times dis dictates your success. So uh, out, uh, shout out to out, out of the box realty. Uh, for me, uh, my company is called Athletes for Computer Science. And again, we teach computer science fundamentals to elementary age kids. We do it via video conference. We're always looking for college students to teach our classes. So college education majors, uh, college computer science majors, uh, take what you know, take what you know how to do and give back to the younger generation. And let's do it in mass. Let's do it at scale. So we're looking to always recruit a pool of uh, motivated college students who want to give back. Uh, so, um, so you can go to athletesforcomputerscience.org uh, to, to go to the website. You can find me personally, Ellis Wims, on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on Twitter. Uh, and, you know, you want to reach out to me, uh, you can always, you know, reach out to me that way. You can fill out, you know, one of our forms on our website. Uh, uh, AFCS is on, on all the social media platforms. So, uh, anybody interested in, you know, being a part of what we're doing, uh, whether you want to be a teacher or whether you want to, uh, give us some financial support, uh, it'd be awesome. But yeah, you know, our goal is to impact a generation of these young people and do it at scale. And I think we have a, a plan and a curriculum and, and, and a vision to get that done. Man, this has been great. And I hopefully you're gonna give me all that information. It's gonna be in the show notes. I, you know, I definitely appreciate your time. Uh, what you're doing for people, especially people uh, all over the world that need to get involved in STEM and how that's growing. You're doing you're doing a tremendous service. Um, and I think that is something that should be highlighted. So definitely please uh, have all that and all the listeners, as you heard, if you're interested in helping and giving back and using your technology skills to help others, please connect. Uh, please connect with him and, and get and get on board with this because I think it's a great idea. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate you being on the show. I learned so much uh, about the NFL and that, that that mindset. I accept your challenge. Uh, I'm gonna see. I'm gonna keep in touch with you. Obviously, we're gonna stay in touch. Absolutely, man. And I, I might have to check in once a year to tell you I didn't get fired. <laughs> and, and I'm one step or closer to my goal. Hey, I'm call me if you need. Hey, you need. I mean, I can talk you down off the cliff if you yeah. call it. People yeah. get on your nerves. Yeah. Call me, bro. I got I was you. Like, I was like, man. I, I, I hey, I hit you up. I see you the info, man. We'll stay connected. Yeah, I was like, I'm almost close. I, I, I got one more year to go to my ten year goal. I can't do it right now. So <laughs> I'm definitely gonna stay in touch. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, definitely uh, leave questions for the podcast listeners. Please like this episode, share this episode. Um, this is a great one, and uh, I'll catch you on the flip side. All right, cool, bro. Thanks, man. Thank you for listening to Positive Filter, a podcast that focuses on family, friends, career, with a little self-help along the way. If you enjoyed this podcast, please share it with your family and friends and like the Facebook page, Spreading Positivity of Movement. Thanks for listening.